at the time it like it was like my laptop and then I was like well I need like a better monitor too so we're gonna go big or go home I guess (laughs) no communicating with one another how dare you (laughs) I thought I established this no friendships (laughs) all right all right oh Anthony what uh could I add on to Daisy's question um what your thoughts are on uh never the grind culture and kind of what like Feng Zhu says, like all nighters, like that whole thing. Oh yeah, don't listen to that guy. That's it. All right, next. I'm just kidding. Yeah, of course I'll I'll expand. Then more than just don't listen to that guy. Um, <clears throat> now Feng's get great. He's got a lot of good insight on a lot of different things, but I'll explain why I don't agree with. So, all right, let's talk about values first. Uh, so Daisy, it's really just a, a matter of like juggling. So if you're juggling three different things all at once, it's really hard. So if you think about like design, think about value and lighting, and then you think about color uh, as different things, it's going to always be easier if you're only managing one thing at a time. And so whenever I do value painting that you see me do, I'm probably going to do right after this stuff. I'm only really juggling like two things and those get you pretty far. And I leave out color specifically because color can be subjective. In fact, it's incredibly subjective. And I'll show you. And a lot of times people think that colors just really make something pop. And the reality is that it's it's really pulling at your heartstrings more than it's making you um, feel uh, it's, it's making you feel something more than it's actually making you be convinced of something. And so when I say convinced, I mean like you're convinced that you're actually looking at an image of a person's face, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at. Like I'm looking at a face here. Uh, I'm looking at a person walking over a corpse of people. Like that's the thing that I'm actually ad- addressing more uh, aggressively here, specifically that, Okay. And so then if we then take this <clears throat> and then we take this and we'll put this onto color layer, really what matters is value and the design. Value will tell us that this is a face and value will tell us the materials and the, um, the forms more than anything else. Color won't do that on its own. So that's why I only focus on design and values because those are probably the most important things to worry about. And the color comes in after. And why is this true? Well, if we were to uh, merge all these together, and if I, or actually, let me just do it separately. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at this person and I wanna put this onto color mode, which nothing should happen because it's the same color but it's important so that I don't change the values on accident when I do this next step. I'm gonna change the hue and just make this guy more of a blue fire guy. And you'll notice that it still looks fine. But now what's happened is now we feel different, right? We feel way different about how this is perceived. And that's why I'm saying that's a little bit more subjective. And I've done paintings where I would start with a whole different color scheme just in the beginning. And maybe I'll, if I have time, I'll do that. And then I'll actually change it in mid painting and then just stick with the new painting setup. And I usually would do it as a demonstration to people because they don't necessarily believe this, but then they were like, oh my gosh, like it's totally doesn't matter. Um, it's just like, how do I want people to feel about it, right? Because this makes you feel more sick, like, oh, this is kind of gross, like you're more like poisoning the environment. Where the original, there's a little bit more of like, it's like, it's fire, right? And obviously there's some subtle changes of green and blues, but those are mostly desaturated versions of the browns and uh, colors that we're seeing. But this just hits that note really aggressively. And if you obviously, if you reduce uh, this, you'll start to see that it's kind of, we're getting somewhere in between. But values is all that matters. And you can look at even at her face and do the same thing, put this on color. And uh, we'll change the hue. And it just gives you a different vibe. Right now she's a mad elf. Right? <coughs> and so that's why um, I don't really worry about color as much. But if you're starting with flat colors, 
that's still addressing local values in, uh, and the colors. You're addressing two things, but you're not addressing like light and form. So it's still kind of juggling very few things, but people get confused with why their painting is suffering when they start to color because they think it's the, their colors that's wrong. But in almost every since instance, like 90% of the time, it's actually your values are trash. And whenever I paint over your values and then put the colors back on, which I will do eventually for the class, you'll see, you'll see that the values is genuinely the reason why your painting is suffering, not the, the colors. But anyway, all right, so that's that. So let's talk about, let's do a painting of a face. Um, and while I'm doing that, oh uh, yeah, let's do, let's do a dude first, a beard. I love beards. I was thinking about growing my beard again, but then I remember it was a thing. Um, so, so work-life balance. I think you only need to spend roughly 40 hours um, minimum, or sorry, maximum a week trying to learn. And this is including the weekends. But minimum surprisingly you only really need to spend maybe um yeah when it comes to minimum you might only really need to spend uh somewhere between 15 to 20 hours a week okay and that goes against the feng Zhu model and the reason why i disagree with this idea of like spending uh all this time is because I think a lot of it has to do with bad practicing. Remember how I was talking earlier that if you just brute force, you'll learn? Remember that? Need a audible confirmation. Do you guys remember this? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I need validation. Um, so the reason why that works is because regardless of whether you know you're learning or not, you're going to be learning. And the problem with that, like I mentioned earlier, is it has a negative effect on your ego and on your um, personal sentiment, right? You start to feel real, you start to feel real, uh, you know, upset about like, <laughs> you just feel really upset about like being, so bad and not feeling like you're learning anything, you know what I mean? And so this is why I think it's really good to just be better about practicing and having more insight and being a lot more smarter when it comes to like how you um, get good, you know? And if you are intentive to how you're studying and you're not just kind of bullshitting it, uh, you'll actually learn just fine with a very minimal amount of effort or rather not minimal effort, but uh, minimal time. Now, the re reason why I rephrased effort, because the effort actually has to be genuine though, it has to be pretty good effort. So when people say like hard work, I like to redefine hard work more as uh, being like in a position where what you're doing is hard and you're not necessarily, um, you're not necessarily feeling comfortable, right? I think that's more important is to be uncomfortable in a situation like you, you should definitely feel like you're, you're on the frontier of learning something as long as you keep staying in that mode. Does that make sense? And so when you start to kind of be in a world where you're constantly just trying to uh, basically like expose your weaknesses more and more often, and just try stuff and break stuff, um, as uncomfortable as that is, then you're going to learn a lot, you know? But the lazy way is the actual way that most people prescribe, which is 14 hours in a, a day, like never sleep. That's actually the lazy way to learn. Because what you're doing is you're just like grinding to the point where your brain has no choice but to learn because it's like 
you're not giving it proper, <laughs> you know, etiquette. And what ends up happening is you start to build around a philosophy that the only way to get good is you have to put countless amounts of hours uh, to achieve any quality of any kind, right? And obviously that's unsustainable. But let's play, let's apply the same philosophy to like getting stronger, you know? Like exercise. Do you guys think that it's a good idea to go to the gym and work out for seven hours straight? Of course. Oh, well then never mind. <laughs> I know that was sarcastic, but you get my point, right? Like obviously that's a terrible idea. Do you also think that it's a terrible idea to let's say never sleep or rest? You know? Of course. You should be resting, right? Uh, if you do any kind of weight training or exercise, one of the biggest uh, strategies to improve is actually rest. The late Kobe Bryant talked about how he would spend like, you know, he would spend countless hours of training and that he ultimately realized it was a mistake because he would train so hard, but then when it was time to play, he would do so poorly. He would perform very bad, you know? And he explained like the reason why that was happening was that like his brain was foggy. He wasn't properly rested. He felt really uh, low energy, you know? And it had actually detrimental effect to his abilities. Does that make sense? And so now let's apply that to art. So if you're spending 14 hours just grinding and painting, there's detrimental effects especially with art because that is our brain in action right and if your brain is running on fumes all, at all times you're not going to progress nearly as well as if you just studied more effectively and as much as things you give that really great advice on other things especially industry related stuff that is by far the worst advice you can give to people okay it worked for him but honestly he could have done it even better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, I also grinded and I realized that it's not as effective because I've learned other things, like I mentioned programming, without spending 14 hour days. I don't, like even if I wanted to, I just don't have the ability to. So I had to come up with a new solution. And I've read some books on this and the science is even on my side. Okay, there's been tremendous amounts of research that has demonstrated that this kind of like study till you till you die kind of approach, and even terms of like you know when people would study for exams uh, and tests, that is that is by far the worst way to get better. It's not that you can't get better; it's the worst way to do it. Okay, and one of the best ways included rest, included interval training meaning that like you would train something like real with real focus and then just don't think about it for like a week. And then you try it again to try to re grab whatever that was in those studies and those practices. Right. They mentioned timed intervals. They mentioned uh, uh, also doing stuff like, uh, like the recall, but also just uh, averaging out your ex exercises. So for instance, if you were trying to get really good at anatomy, uh, you should have some focused studies, but you should also study things that are a little bit outside of that, like maybe gestures and forms, right? So that way you can kind of have a general sense, have the context. Uh, they recommend you should do tests constantly. They say that tests have a bad rap, and I agree, like tests are usually seen as something that when you fail, that means you're just dumb. But the way that you should really think about tests is that they're just more of a gauge of your uh, ability at the moment, right? Like if you, for instance, Stephen, if you were to do calculus, a calculus test right now and you failed it, does that mean you're stupid, <laughs> right? It's no, it's like, what does that actually mean? It means you just don't know calculus, right? Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you get that, right? So then why would anyone think in it otherwise? It's just because in uh, our current school system, the way that it's built, 
is that you need to move on to the next series of classes, right? And so if you can't keep up, your peers are the ones that like make fun of you, right? The people that are around you, like the people that are with you. Like, well, you don't know basic arithmetic, you know? There was this, um, there was this test that was done a long time ago that actually led to California having some really stupid laws today. But anyway, the, the test was to see people's IQs. It was the early stages of IQ tests. And, and they were generally biased and racist, right? Because what ended up happening was that they would give these tests to black children and these black children would fail these tests. So they would be like, oh yeah, they're stupid. They're like, they're really low IQ. But the tests themselves were like flawed because they would say stuff like, what's jade, right? And if you lived in an African-American household, you just might not know what jade is because you've never seen it, heard it in your life based off of your cultural experience and environmental experience, right? So who, who determines that that makes you stupid, right? That's not a really good test. That's not a good gauge of intelligence. And what ends up happening is that they created these laws around this IQ and kids that were fine, they just didn't know stuff like Jade, ended up in special classes and then those special ed classes uh, kept them behind. And then when they were, when the laws changed and people realized it was fucking racist and terrible, um, it was too late. A lot of these kids were already way behind. They were like four, three or four grades behind, you know? And because of the way the educational system worked, you couldn't just put somebody in. They had to start where they're at, right? That's why like places like, I believe like Sweden and some other European nations, they have a different school system in which that is not based off of testing. It's based off of experience. It's based off of collective growth, you know? And that's why you're starting to see a lot better test scores, specifically in high school and uh, elementary. And even just the quality of life is higher in these places where the grind culture attitude, uh, you see a lot more uh, anxiety and depression, more suicides in nations that are like this. Think of Far East nations like Korea, Japan, right? Uh, India, they have high, high suicide rates. There's like factories where they, or there's buildings that have nets to catch people from jumping out of the buildings, right? Um, but sure, yeah, you're gonna have these people that are like, like Elon Musk who make Tesla cars. Cool. But the question is, do we need Tesla cars? Do we need better smartphones? Do I really need all of my packages delivered to me the same day? You know, there's a real good question there, isn't there? Of like, what do we actually care about? And it's really great that this, this, the terrible uh, COVID-19 has actually revealed what we really care about like I see some people protesting and some people have legitimate concerns and I agree with them. Like they're not working, they're afraid for their fucking livelihood, that's fine. But the other people are like, we can't get our hair did? I'm like, all right, like go home, dude. <laughs> you know, that's not a thing that we should be worried about. You know, there's civil liberties that were being lost, I get it, but it's the collective good that's also pretty important. But my point is, is that like this grind mentality is a culture of thinking that actually I don't think is good. You know, that's the game that we play right now. I know how to play that game and I don't think we should be playing the game at all in just general, right? I think it's really bad for us as a species. It's not good for you in terms of actual growth anyway. The science is against it, you know? And that's why when you have companies like Naughty Dog who keep making games like this, they keep getting results, right? Because it works, it still works. Of course it works. Like if you, everybody works 10, 12 hour days every day on the weekends, of course you're gonna have high quality, you know? Because it's just the nature of just uh, amount of hours in, you know? But if you were to ask me, um, could you also do that without putting that much effort? I would point you to games like Spider-Man that just came out for the PlayStation. You guys see that game? That game was praised for its visual fidelity. You guys remember that? You guys know what game I'm talking about? The new one that came out by Insomniac? Yeah. 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 They don't fucking grind, right? They just don't. I mean, they may grind occasionally, like your passion grind, you know, like I want to kind of get this done because like I want to put that last bow on it. That's a little bit different, right? Versus like I got to put like 10 hours every day because someone made a bad choice and I'm under pressure. 
You know what I mean? There's a huge difference between those two circumstances. Do you guys agree? And so like, there's a difference. Like if I, like when I was working on those games that I shared with you guys, I, I had nights where I stayed up a little later, but it wasn't because I felt pressured to. It's because I wanted to, because I really wanted to, to finish it, you know, and feel good about it when I was done. I still feel like I could add some more time to it, but you know, I also appreciate just, you know, it's okay. You know, I learned and I conquered moving on in my life. Right. And so uh, I think that there is a real problem there that people think that that's to be expected. And let me just be clear to you, like the general audiences out there, and this includes some of you guys, you guys might not even realize that you're part of the problem too. Uh, don't care for us uh, on the boots individuals, right? They pretend to care, but they generally don't. Okay. And this includes us. And I'll give a great example. I mentioned Red Rockstar's game, Red Dead Redemption. If you bought that game and played it and you love it, just know that the people who worked on that spent 16 hours a day. They don't get any bonuses that you would think would be reasonable or even rational for all the time lost, right? And as much as they did their like forward facing when people did come out because people were like, hey, they're making them work so much, right? people still bought the fucking game and it still did gangbusters. Do you think Rockstar is going to make any changes to their approach? And the answer to that is no, I already know I have insider information. <laughs> okay. Nothing has changed and nothing will change. You get it? <clears throat> and I had a friend, she was like sharing articles and she's one of those types that are really, really social justice types, you know, uh, like really hardcore. Uh, and she's like, oh, man, I can't believe this. You know, treat the workers with respect, all this kind of great things, right? But then when it came down to it, um, she bought the game. <laughs> and the game sold millions. And I, I kind of confronted her on that. And I was like, you do realize that you, you, you should protest with your wallet, not with your words, right? Like, it's going to suck. Some of those employees are going to definitely suffer from the backlash from the people. but also, Rockstar might have to start to change their philosophy in general, you know? Otherwise, they're going to keep being awarded for their efforts, however they got there, you know? Uh, and don't worry, man. Like, I'm not uh, holier than thou either, and I make these mistakes too. Like, I recently realized I should stop uh, ordering stuff on Amazon, specifically because there are people that are in danger because of my, uh, my need to have that power stripped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should stop doing that. That's why I started going out more and getting stuff directly, you know, because I realize that there are conveniences that I too, you know, uh, have been accustomed to. It's just how we are. And I, I don't agree with it. And so I need to be better about uh, avoiding it for myself because I, I think fundamentally it's a problem on a cultural level. Uh, and as a practical level too, I don't think it actually is as useful as people make it out to be, you know? And I like to think of like the working out analogy the best, you know, working out more actually doesn't necessarily make you get more strength gains. In fact, rest and intelligent uh, and proper training, you know, more efficient training gets you those results. <clears throat> Does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. A good a good way to now answer that question practically. So that was more of a philosophical approach of understanding the why I don't agree with this. The practical one is to use a timer, right? A practical uh solution is to uh actually think of it as spreading your time out over a long period of time instead of trying to get it all done in a day. So instead of thinking of it like this, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, instead of saying, um, instead of doing something like this, where you're gonna like towards, let's just say for like before the class comes in on Wednesday, you guys spend, you know, one, one, two, and then like, you know, Saturday, Sunday, you're probably thinking, oh, you know, I have, I have time still. This is usually what happens. And then when Monday rolls around, uh, you still might only put like a few more hours. And then Tuesday rolls around, and that's when 
Like maybe that's when you start to actually work, but even then you don't, it's hard to work for long stretches of time. This is usually what people's time looks like, right? Like people usually do the brunt of their work the day, the, the days leading up to the final submission, right? I'm sure most of you guys understand this and have experienced this, if not doing this already, right? So let's add up those hours. Let's think about it. Like, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, what is it? 15 hours, right? And usually, like I said, these last few days are pretty consecutive and a lot of uh, effort usually goes in these two days, like the days leading up to the final day. So you left, you let in about 15 hours uh, of work. But the reality is usually this is what happens. People put in lo like very low effort. Uh, this is, let's just pretend that Wednesday is the only day you guys got to submit. So there's no Friday class. So usually people won't do anything up until like the last few days. But even here, they probably wouldn't do that much because they say, oh, I got Monday and Tuesday. And then they start to grind like however long time. And if you look at this, this is even less time, right? Because that's uh, 11, that's 14 hours. Hold on, let me turn off my alarm. It's my alarm to start to eat and finish class. Um, but don't worry, I'll do one more painting and answer some more questions. Um, so that's even 14 hours, okay? Now let's do something really reasonable and let's spend uh, three hours every day, an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half before you go to bed, say something like that. And you start on a Thursday. So three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours. And let's just say for whatever reason, you just can't submit that day, you know, because that's the day of, or you can't work that day because that's just the day of submission. Right? Well, three times five is 15 plus three is uh, 18. So you've actually put in more time with less stress. You see that? Do you guys see that? Yes, sir. And you're, when you look at yes. it this way, you're just like, holy fuck, dude, that's like way more time and um, it's less stress, right? And you guys, are, you guys are almost certainly aware of this problem, this strategy, right? Like work till the day before, right? I'm sure, like I said, so I'm sure if you, some of you guys experienced this now currently for the class or have done this in the past or just in general, just do this. And that's not a, that's not, that's not a problem. Like, you know, you could still kind of just do that. Like there's no reason why this can't be five hours but then you're only adding even more time to this, right? It's only becoming more exponential. So now we're at 22 hours, right? But think of it like this. You're like, three hours still seems like no problem. Like, couldn't I just do two hours in the morning and two hours at night? That's four hours, right? So then if we change it to four and we do four times six now, now we have 24 hours. You see, see what I'm getting at? Yeah. And this idea of spending 12 hour days every day, of course, we are going to do a lot of time. That's going to get, that's exponential. I don't, I can't do that math in my head right away, but you see that that's like a lot. That's like in the hundreds probably, or almost a hundred. We're getting there. What is that? Let me do it. 24, 48. Uh, fuck, what is that? 48 is 60, 72, 72 hours, right? So of course that's like, that's awesome. Look at all those hours. But like I mentioned before, there's a detriment to this, right? There's like at some point, maybe like half of that time is worthless, right? Do you guys agree? Probably, yeah. Yeah, no, it's not probably. It's actually a fact, but I'm just trying to have you guys agree. <laughs> no, I'm agreeing with you, yeah. Yeah, it's, most it like, it's, it's, it's it is clearly a waste because like I've showed you guys before, if you're just guessing a lot, that's a waste of your time, right? If you're just massaging bad habits and correcting it, that's a bad habit, right? That's a waste of time. You can see you start, if you start eliminating this and start being a lot more focused, you're gonna be better. And there's reason to believe that you can study in these four hour section sessions. There's no reason why you can't. Don't think that you only can grind. Like you could spend half of this time studying, half the time making some work, right? You just turn off your phone, 
you unplug yourself from the internet unless you have the reference you need to get. Get that reference first, right? And just study. And know that the next day you're gonna put another four hours in confidently, right? That there is time. There's plenty of time because we've just mapped it out. There's 24 hours. That's a lot of time to really stay focused on one individual thing. A lot of time, right? But people don't think of that way. They don't look at the time this way. But let's let's spread it out even further. So let's say you you grind like this, right? The 72 hour work week. That can only really last maybe healthily, like you can before you start to die right? <laughs> Six weeks. Okay. And then maybe, so let's just make it an even two months. Let's say for two months, you are able to grind hard. Okay. But this will require a long rest period. And usually it will, you'll be off for two yeah. months, maybe even longer. Right. I honestly think people like really fall off and take a longer breaks, but let's just make it even three months. Okay. In fact, yeah, let's let's make it even e more realistic because I know this is probably the reality. People take long ass breaks. It like it gets away from them. When you go too hard, you stop for a long time. Right? And so let's do the math here. Let's just say 72 hours. 72 hours. So that's 8 weeks, right? So that's about 500 and 76, and if we times that by two, because we'll just do this for the whole year. So the whole year would look like 1,500, or 1,152 hours, okay? Now let's just say you do the four hour approach every day, because I excluded, look, I excluded Wednesday, right? But let's, even Wednesday you should be doing something, right? Every day, so we this is easy. We just times that by 365, right? 365 times four. Look at that. We're we are about 300 more hours on top of that. This is excluding this is this is including the idea that this person burns out, okay which is a very real thing. And you guys have experienced it, I'm sure, right? This is without burnout, right? This is with burnout. And honestly, even if you were to account for, let's say, because it's a lot, of, it's gonna be a much larger number. Let's just go for a, a more reasonable, hardworking person, like an, a good average, like a 55 hour work week, right? And we did that for 52 weeks, it's gonna be a much, much larger number, right? But like I said, with diminishing returns, because I think half of that time is just wasted on bad habits and overcorrecting, right? So if you divide that by two, look at that. Because I think half that time is still kind of a waste of time. You're still lower than if you were just moderately working at a consistent pace. You see that? There is no way that somebody is putting like, like eight to 10 hours a day and getting real, real value uh, out of that. It's real brute force. You know what I mean? And I have students who approach it the way that I've explained it to you guys very thoroughly, like be more methodical, be more thoughtful, right? And they spend four or five hours a day, no problem. That have gotten really good, you know? And for me, I think that's really important that people kind of realize that. I had a student who was putting 12 hours a day in his work. And uh, my critique to him was to stop doing that, right? And so then he started doing that. He stopped. He started to be a lot more, um, he started being a lot more thoughtful, right? And sure enough, he was able to take 12 hours to six hours. And he was doing just as good, which was shocking to him because he thought he had to, but he realized after like the kind of talk that I just had with you guys, that a lot of his, his effort was like, was just correction and bad habits. 
adjusting uh, with his bad habits, you know? And then when he removed that, uh, some of those bad habits, like some of the bad habits that he had was noodling. He was noodling too much. He'd spend, um, instead of just drawing really good and making some good choices in the very beginning, right? Like I've been ta t teaching you guys, he would noodle. He would just noodle, noodle, noodle. And he stopped doing that. He started being a little bit more uh, intentive with his artwork, right? And uh, he started seeing improvements dramatically. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. Um, when you talked about the Kobe Bryant um, analogy, um, so I used to like, I watch a lot of basketball and I follow him a lot. So ever since then, um, I started like, sort of like taking that mentality into painting as well. Just like really going at it and then like painting more and more just so that gets into the habit. I think it helps. Yeah. What I love about Kobe was he's a little bit of both, right? He worked way hard and he was really aggressive, especially early in his career. But then he came to realize that it was actually detrimental. And it was not about how hard it was more about consistency. He was able to do it every day. He was first one in, first one out type of thing, you know, which was great. But he, he learned that he needed to take a break. So he started meditating more. He started to uh, sleep more. He would try to get before he would only sleep. Okay. Uh, he would only, <coughs> he would only um, sleep three hours before, right when he first started. And he's like, that's clearly not healthy. And so then he started to sleep nine to 10 hours sometimes, you know, eight to 10, eight hours minimum, but like he's trying to aim for like nine, you know? Um, because he realized that sleep was just as powerful. Like he needed his body to recover from all that hard training. And that's why I said you should restructure hard work as in putting yourself in discomfort more often rather than thinking of hard work as uh, just tons and tons of hours, okay? Because that works too. It does. It's just the worst way <laughs> is what I'm getting at, okay? That's the big thing I want you guys to take away from that. I don't want you to think that if you spend seven hours a day that you're not getting any value out of that. You are. I'm just saying you can probably do get away with just spending uh, at most six hours and get just as much value out of that. I think six hours is a good cutoff. But there are moments where you're going to feel really happy and really excited about what you're learning and you're going to want to spend like another few hours just because you're in it. You know, There's nothing wrong with that, right? But that's that is still a problem because even when I was like doing weight training and I was getting stronger, for instance, I would like do more, you know, and I was starting to get injuries. Right. So you have to be, you have to be very cautious. You have to have balance on when you realize that you can push yourself a little further uh, without any consequence and versus when you need to just take a, a break. Like uh, it's hard for me sometimes to just sit, you know what? I just need to take a break. Like my wife is really good about helping me do that. You know, um, and it's beneficial to me. Like I remember when, especially with weight training, I took like uh, two days of like I was working out like every day, and then I was like, all right, I need to like rest because I could start feeling my bones aching, you know. And I took like um, I like took two days off, uh, or actually I think I even took longer. I think like took like three days off, and then I came back to the gym and I, I was stronger. So it's like obvious why, right? Because my body was like, all right, finally, geez, you know. And it just let me heal. Uh, I was overworking myself uh, because I've been working and doing classes and doing some stuff on the side, right? So then obviously I needed to take a break. That's why I had to move my class. But you guys are gracious enough to let that happen with no complaints, you know? Because most people are reasonable and they're not gonna be like, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you can see now like uh, all of that hard work and effort of like um, of being more methodical with my training led me to faster and faster paintings because I was uh, failing faster uh, and more, more focus, right? And I'll do it often. 
There's a book called Make It Stick and Mastery. Uh, these two books you should read if you want to learn anything about like practice paradigms and such. Anyway, let's take some other questions because that, that was pretty much just one question, but I think it was pretty important. And a lot of you guys suffer from this type of problem, so yeah. I don't mind. I, I wanted to ask you, I was watching a, a tutorial, I think it was more fine art related, where the guy, uh -huh. he explains a lot about like the structure of the skull, etc., etc. And it goes into like really deep, like he explains like the back of the skull and all the little protrusions and stuff. Sure. And he said, it's really important to know all that, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt like, isn't that a bit overdone? I mean, when will <laughs> I ever true. draw like the back of a skull, which is usually covered with hair or cloth or anything? Oh yeah, so that's, so that's a good assessment. No, I agree so with it, you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the reason why that person probably explained it that way, and they're not wrong, you know, the, if the more you know something, the better you're going to do it, right? Um, yeah, sure. But there is like a, there, like back to this idea of diminishing returns, like how much of that is necessary, right? Mm. And as a concept artist, uh, you don't need, you can get away with some just good, maybe even great understanding of anatomy. You don't need yeah. to have 100%, right? Um, that's yeah. why concept art is very attractive to a lot of people because it's, it's very impressionistic, you know, uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but, but don't get me wrong. I think the, the more people stick to impressionistic abilities, they also miss out on a lot of fundamentals. So there's a really yeah. definitely a good balance, right? And the way that I like to think about it, uh, is the way you should think about this is in terms of what's important. Okay. Is, mm the reality of what will actually be seen versus what actually needs to be like known, right? So you're yeah. right. If the back of the skull is going to be hardly ever drawn, like I actually probably have drawn the back of the skull very few times, you know, mm -hmm. then, then maybe that can be left for as external knowledge uh, rather than internal knowledge. And what yeah. I mean by external, meaning that like you would need to get, gather reference to get that right. All right? right. Okay. And that's fine. But internal knowledge, you should know how the back of the skull uh, looks in a general sense, right? So yeah. that way you don't have to like, to even get started, you have to go look at it, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of like, I got to look at it to make sure I cross my T's and dot my I's, you know, to really make it um, clear to whoever's going to look at my image later, right? Yeah. But in terms of like, so for instance, this face is clear right there's very little that is left to interpretation right but yeah. if i really want to make this accurate which i would if i'm working for a company and they want to have the final version i would start to gather reference of like a real person and try to do a really good job you know mm. but i have yeah. a good basic knowledge so i can kind of get away with uh, having it good not perfect you know yeah and it's just a really good question about that, you know? And I tend to like to draw um, with the intention that I have control over what's going on. And so if I don't know how to draw, let's say like a person's head really well, then mm -hmm. I'm going to study that a lot. So right now, like there's stuff, stuff in 3D that I just feel like I could do better, right? And yeah. I'm, I'm like trying to find ways because right now I'm like using other people's stencils and stuff like that. And it's the same way I feel like about brushes. It's like, I don't really know a lot of the people's intentions. So I need to like create my own brushes so that way I can have a better understanding. Because when you start to construct things for yourself, you have a, a greater, deeper understanding of why it was constructed, which may make you understand why other people constructed the stuff that they've done and you can see more value out of it instead of just kind of just assuming you understand. Yeah. And so that's what I'm doing with 3D, for instance, right? I'm really trying to um, gather like a larger understanding on things, you know? And mm -hmm. so um, for me, especially whenever I'm uh, trying to get good at something, I will learn very specific things uh, that are very related to my immediate problems, right? And yeah. so, so with that being said though, 
uh, like I was mentioning earlier, like you should learn like really good anatomy, you know? Yeah. Uh, and when yeah, I say I good, deny. yeah, when I say good, I don't mean like you will now be like a surgeon, and you know, like yeah. how to like surgically <laughs> remove somebody's lungs. Like that's like medically good anatomy. <laughs> okay. That's not what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah. But you get, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, like anatomy that like when people see it they like for instance you look at this face it looks like it has some good structure to it you're not like confused of the structure you know yeah, yeah. um that's the kind of stuff that you should be good at um so that way you can manipulate it you can like adjust it and then when it's game time right like to actually make it appeasing to others um mm. or, or rather like useful for others like someone else can take this and then work from it as a model, um, you can do that, you know, because you can just go look at reference and fill in the gaps that you don't really have answers for. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I think that, um, when people do that, like, uh, it's really more affirmation of their own, uh, uh, what I like to think of as like investment bias. So when you invest all mm. your time learning what the back of the skull is, uh, for someone like me to say, no, you don't really need to know that. Like, that, that mm. hurts. <laughs> it cuts deep, right? Because they spent yeah. all that time learning it to then tell them that it's not that necessary, you know? Um, but they're bigger, bigger fish to fry, I guess, than learning yeah. the, the details of the back of the skull. If you're trying to yeah. be a really great anatomy instructor, you must know these things. I think that's yeah, sure. the context. Right. Uh, if you're a concept artist, not really. Mm. okay i even yeah. think like even an illustrator or anything like more creative uh not really because you can always just use reference to fill in no. the gaps but a base understanding absolutely when i say you should learn your anatomy i mean like you should understand it like you saw what i did earlier right mm. like yeah with, I like did. the, the yeah. correction of the arm and all that stuff that's a great I mean, example of like if you don't have that base understanding you, you're going to make a lot of like M amateur mistakes you know mm -hmm. all right cool but yeah Thanks. knowing like the back of the skull and all of the secondary muscles that are underneath all of our other muscles those aren't nearly as important it will make your image look that much more convincing but uh there's a there's a threshold of convincingness that you might realize you don't need to push towards mm -hmm. all right anyway okay a question cool. yeah Okay, so it's uh, it's more related to the uh, to the jobs in general. So we already talked about the difference uh, being a generalist versus uh -huh. being master of something. Now, is this um, uh, is this valid everywhere? Or I mean, maybe in a studio. If you're a master of something, uh, you are more valuable, or like the studios are looking for uh, these people specifically. But yeah. this is also true for freelancers because I feel that maybe being a freelancer, uh, being a freelancer, um, I don't know. Maybe you can approach to different scenarios uh, where you can maybe do environment or character design or stuff like this. And so, yeah, you can be, you can get more job requests in this uh, sense. Yeah, that's true. You can get more job opportunities, but the, the reality is, uh, are you going to get good jobs? Right? Mm -hmm. Because usually people who are generalists are generally not good, right? If that's their aim is to be good at general stuff, right? Um, but if you are a master at one thing and learn stuff generally, that's actually a way better position, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll show it to you in a different light lens too, but it makes it very obvious why you should aim for specialization. And I think that when I, when I think of generalizing, you should think of generalizing your tool set. Like you shouldn't be stuck to just painting. You should learn 3d, you should learn photo bashing, learn everything. You're just a badass character designer, creature designer. Right. Like that is like your field of study. It's like whenever you hear these doctors on TV who have a doctor in front of them, doesn't mean that they are virologists, right? There's like the guy, um, 
Dr. Drew, who's like he's like the host of Love Line. He was like going around saying like the the COVID nineteen is like not the flu. The flu is worse, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And people believe them because he's a doctor, but he's not a virologist, right? Which is the studying of <laughs> of viruses, right? Like he studies uh people's love lives and and psychiatry. Like that's a different field of expertise, you know. <laughs> There's not like a doctor out there who's a heart surgeon, a neurosurgeon. You know, Uh, you know, like they're like, I don't want like a generalist doctor who's kind of good at all of these things. You want a specialist, right? Mm -hmm. And that's true for like almost all these other industries, even in our own. But like, think of it like this too. You're in a position where you have studied all of these different disciplines at an average level, right? So this is the amount of time that you spend versus let's say a specialist who spent the same amount of time but only on one discipline. Yeah. So you have this person who's spending on several different different disciplines, right? Environments, props, max, uh, and illustration, right? Those are all individually, like one person's really good at all these things, right? Individually. For instance, this person is only good at character design, right? Where maybe you're pretty good at it, okay? Mm-hmm. But if we were to just look at the time spent, obviously this person person two is going to be better right Thank you. Yep. obviously right and this is in the same span of time because like i said it takes time to get good you can't change that right <laughs> so then what ends up happening is okay when their job comes like to your point you know they this company might be looking for someone who can do a d uh, you know type of skill you know hey i got that and you, you apply right this person probably can't, right? If we have it a C situation, you can apply. If it's a B situation, you can apply, right? Mm-hmm. And this person cannot. But once it's an A position, this person can, right? Who's going to win that job? Yeah, of course, the second. Yes. So here's mm-hmm. the part that people don't realize is that there is a person for everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. It's not like you're only going against this one person and all these other person are just like hidden. No, they all exist. All the specialists exist. And you're always going to lose out to the specialist every single time. Right? Okay. So you the see? point is that uh, maybe it's not you that you have to Hold adapt. on. Let me finish my point and you'll have all the answers. Okay? Uh-huh. So let's say you do get a job because someone is letting you in on that average skill on A, B, C, D, because they do need a generalist. It's an indie studio that only has a budget of 100,000, so they can only really hire two artists. They hire you and another artist uh, and another artist, so they can all pay you about $30,000 between the two, like thirty dollars to $40,000 a year between the three of you, okay? Versus a multi-million dollar, like AAA studio who has a million dollars for their artistic budget, and can pay each artist upwards of a hundred thousand and even two hundred thousand dollars for five to six artists, okay, who can all be specialists in their respected fields. This project's obviously gonna have a higher quality, right? Mm-hmm. Than this project, right? This one's gonna be like, I'm gonna put like three stars for the sake of speed, and this is only one star, right? Mm-hmm. And check out, check out what else happens. You are surrounded by other mediocre artists, right? Mm-hmm. Versus you're surrounded by the, the most elite. So think about this, right? Not only are you being paid more, you're also surrounded by fucking rock stars, dude, right? Mm-hmm. You're gonna be way more motivated to push your work because you're surrounded by excellence and you're asked to do excellence right? And you should be because that's why they hired you in the first place. You had it in your portfolio, right? It is a circle jerk of the gods, <laughs> okay? Here, that just doesn't happen, okay? And if you think of it like this too, let me think, let me put it to you in a different circumstance and you tell me who you think would still do a better job, okay? Let's say you had a million dollar budget over here. And all you wanted to do was hire generalists. 
right? Yeah. So over here, maybe you're looking to hire five or six specialists. And over here, you can probably hire 20, maybe even 30 generalists, yeah. right? Potentially. Do you still think that this right here, the quality bar is still the same? That this will stay low and this will stay high? Yeah. Or would this go up higher? Because you have more people, you have more generalists. Yeah, statistically, you can uh, get more, like, more quality, maybe because you pick one, two persons that are the, that are the greatest. Yes. Uh, so it doesn't matter, right? Like if you make more, you hire more generalists, you get it? No. It's like having a, a team of like high schoolers, like 20 high schoolers go against LeBron James, Michael Jordan, and Kobe Bryant. They're going to get destroyed by these three monoliths of the basketball game, right? Mm -hmm. So think about what you're trying to say. You just want to get a job. Yes, of course, you can get a job sooner as a generalist, but you might fall into a trap that I myself and many others have fell into because I've done this myself as, you know, as well. I was in a job where I was paid low, around this range, right? Which is still mm -hmm. pretty high for your just average employee in any kind of job, right? But in context of like the AAA circumstances, it's different, right? Um, and I was surrounded by other people that were just like me, just kind of just wanted to work, you know, didn't really care about pushing themselves, you know, and that company made garbage stuff, you know, uh, I was doing the animation, I was doing modeling, I was doing concept, I was doing all that stuff at no particular high level. And that studio ultimately got shut down because it was a garbage studio and we were all garbage people making garbage games, right? Mm -hmm. And when that company shut down, I looked at my portfolio and I realized I had nothing that I liked. Everything was trash. Understand. And this is just true for a lot of people. People don't realize this until it's too late. Okay. I'm trying to prevent you from this. Okay. Specializing gets you in a better position. That's all I'm getting at. Right now with all that being said, to be really good at something may not take that long, right? Like it may take like five or six years, maybe even now, I think it's actually shorter because of all the resources, you know, that are available to you, right? Including software, educational platforms, all of that stuff. I'm including all of that, you know? There's an ungodly amount of resources for you these days. You get it? Mm -hmm. So you can get really good, like really specialized at one thing if you're really focused and you're consistent, like I was showing you earlier, right? For a few years, you can get pretty fucking good, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you look at the span of your whole lifetime, if you're very lucky and you don't have any really traumatic thing happen to you or any kind of tragedy, right? Like where you die too young, you know? If you live in your 80s to your hundreds, three to four years is nothing, dude, right? No. And, and then you think about it, okay, well, I've met, let's say you spent the five, six years, which I think is a really good metric to get really fucking good, right? Like if that's all your focus is, because that's pretty much what I did. And I got really good at character design, you know? Mm -hmm. Then you can start to do what I did too, which is started learning like programming and 3D and all this other stuff, right? And if I put another five to six years into these things, which I'm getting closer to do, right? Then I'm gonna get really good at those. And if I spend 20, like 20 to 30 years doing all of the stuff, like learning environments, learning characters, learning props, I'm going to be like in my 60s maybe, right? And I'm going to be like legendary, dude. <laughs> but like I said, nothing has changed. Time. You have to invest time to get good at the, each of these di disciplines to the point of mastery. You just have to, Okay. And if you spread yourself too thin, just because you can get a job, you might end up wasting time, dude. You might get a job and you think, well, when I get a job, I won't forget what AJ said. I'm going to keep working on myself and improving. And then you end up spending 10 hour days working for a studio that can't manage you, right? And manage their expectations. And you go home tired. You don't want to work on anything else. Yeah. So might as well just come out of the gate swinging is what I'm getting at. No, don't learn the hard way, right? And I'm making the point of like, you can totally be a generalist. Like you can totally be a badass generalist. They, they are starting to become easier to do because like I said, all the resources are becoming more available and the, the 
concepts and stuff are being more available. But I'm going to tell you, there are people who are, are uh, too specialized that can also be a problem, right? So you want to like be diverse in how special, like I am a character designer and I think about that in terms of uh, designing for movies, for games, right? For mm -hmm. TV shows, for animation, right? And then the genres don't matter to me either. It can be contemporary, it can be horror, it can be fantasy, right? Um, so I can diversify in that regard, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've been asked to do environments and I'm not bad at them. I do all right. I'm like a good environment artist, not a great one. Like I wouldn't hire my me um, over certain other people. Like I know there's a lot of people that are much better, but I do have that like go get them attitude, you know? And so uh, I know it's a matter of just effort. And I've been literally given a job as an environment artist. I've been doing really good with these guys because I'm a good one. I'm not a terrible one, but I'm thinking even to myself, like, okay, now it's time. Like this is my job. I'm going to make it like my main focus. I want to be like, like really good, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> and now I'm offered that opportunity. So I'm going to, to take advantage of that opportunity. So hopefully this gives you kind of a better understanding of like generalists, of course, have more opportunities because there's a lot more smaller studios that can't afford the big, big guys, you know? But it's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. Right, like if you if you can hire a specialist in each individual discipline, then you will, right? Why wouldn't you want to hire your favorite artists who do great environments? Hire your favorite artists who do great creature design. Hire your favorite artists who do great character design. Of course you would, right? Why would you hire someone who's kind of okay at all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And if you really think about it, there's only very few people who are pretty good at multiple things, right? And even those people that you're probably thinking about, think about like individually, is there someone that you think would still be even better? Like so many, like Feng Zhu is a great example, right? Like Feng Zhu can do a lot of different things, right? Mm -hmm. But can you think of somebody who could do better mechs than Feng Zhu? I'm sure you can. Can you think of somebody who could do better environments than Feng Zhu? I'm sure you can, you know? That's my point. And Fang is expensive too because he is still pretty good at each of those disciplines and he's pretty quick, right? That has a lot of value, that speed. My value is also uh, accompanied with that. He needs more environments, I need more characters. But I'm coming, dude. I'm coming for those environments too. <laughs> Give me like one more year, dude. I'm gonna be an insane environment artist. People are gonna be shocked. I will, go ahead. <laughs> But it's not like I haven't been practicing environments at all. I like guess the first time I've ever touched doing environments. I've been doing them at least off and on for like five years. Oh, it's just wow. now, yeah, it's just now I'm going to be doing it seriously. I'm going to take it very, very seriously. I've been learning perspective and all that good stuff okay. offline. That's why you haven't seen me post anything because I'm in learning mode right now, dude. Mm. You're still in the shy stage. No, it's not shy. It's just that I'm learning. Like all the stuff that I do is not worth showing. And it's not that it's bad. It's just like me learning how to make a pillow. You know, it's like, it's just like tool oriented learning and like fundamental, like nobody needs to see my like perspective drawing. Mm -hmm. It's for me and for me alone. It's like uh, when I f was learning how to do uh, characters, I had my uh, book of, or sketchbooks full of uh, anatomy studies and they're all trash mm -hmm. because it was my trash can draw and learn. You know, I think a lot of times people think that even their sketches and their learning has to look good. And that's a huge mistake. It's supposed to look like trash. You're learning, you know? Um, that, that's the beauty we talked about. Yeah. I, I recommend uh, people to share their work as often as they can, though, still. And if you're in that learning phase, it's better to have, like, a blog, you know, or some sort of Tumblr or something like that. In fact, I should probably do that with my environment stuff. It'll keep me more accountable. Like, create, like, a blog specifically for my environments as I get better uh, at them. AJ, um, so I, was, I have a question regarding like... Um, Actually, jobs. we might have to end the cl class now. Oh, so okay. if your question isn't that long, uh, I can try to answer it. But if I feel like it is, just try to ask it next class and I'll make sure to answer it first. All right, cool. Uh, because I don't, um, I don't come from um, an art background 
and I bar like barely have a portfolio. I'm basically just practicing um, whenever I can. So what at what stage do I get to to like you know create a portfolio or find yeah. a job regarding this? I I think people should do it right away. Like even like okay. I'm I'm telling you that I'm not sharing my environment, environmental uh, mm -hmm. studies. I should. That's what I was thinking. I, I should make a blog or something. You should just create yeah. an environment where you feel it's okay to share it. Like it's kind of forgiven, right? Yeah. Um, the reason why is because you're building a, a, a habit of sharing your work. It creates a different sense of accountability. Mm. A lot of people don't share their work and then they come to me and they're like, hey, how come nobody hires me? And I'm like, because nobody knows you exist, <laughs> you know? And okay, so, so. so sharing your portfolio as soon as possible is my advice. Uh, and what you do is you start to cycle out. So when right. you start making new artwork, you replace the old uh, artwork with your new artwork. Okay. So basically the portfolio would be consistent of your best images, huh, basically. And then Yeah, the you just keep making it. Be, yeah, right. you just keep making it because because you want to be in the habit of producing artwork. Mm. Uh in the beginning I did that really well. So like right now I, I don't and I don't feel necessarily that I have to either, because I already have like a huge following. I already have like literally hundreds of images floating online. Mm. You know, it's, it's not as imminent for me. I get jobs just as a product of what's already existing online, you know? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't feel as pressured as maybe some of you guys do. So it, but it is good advice to share work often. Really. Okay. Trust me on this. Okay. And right. so, yeah, for me, uh, I'm going to share this because I haven't done anything in a while. So I was like, all right, I'm going to polish these up. But I feel comfortable almost every time I do a character sketch that is going to come out boss. I'm not even worried about it, you know? Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm, I'm used to drawing characters and I'm pretty good at them. And so I, I don't have any issue of sharing stuff like this, uh, even if it's just a sketch. Because my sketches, specifically when it comes to characters, are bomb diggity, you know? Because it's been earned over the many years of me practicing. You know what I mean? Yeah, but if you're starting out, like I said, you should create a um, you should create a paradigm in which you are essentially practicing all the time. Yeah, and okay. sharing your work all the time. Yeah, uh, nobody's going to pay attention to your bad artwork. I think it's okay to um, I think it's okay to have this feeling of. Like you don't want to like share your your work with everybody and having a portfolio aside from the stuff you share online. That's perfectly yeah. fine, right? But as you start to make pieces that you do like, you want to put it in your portfolio. You want to start showing it to people like at events. Maybe in the future there may be some other way if you could share it because right now it's crazy. But you share it to somebody like a professional and they're going to tell you why it's god awful and then you can work on that. All right. If you have nothing to show, you don't know what to improve upon, right? It's like in this class, okay. if you didn't show me your work, I wouldn't tell you what to work on. Mm. You know, you just feel safe because it's like I'm a, your teacher and I'm instructing you versus like... Would I be work. able to share with you what I've done uh, maybe in the next few classes? Uh, towards the very end, yes. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. I'm going to go. All there. right. Cheers, friends. Great work as always. Keep up the good and positive vibes. I appreciate you all. And uh, cheers. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for sitting in for the rest of the class. And I'll talk to you guys when I talk to you. Rest so, well. See you. Bye. Bye. See ya. Yeah. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.